squadron leader Paul Day taxis a Spitfire of the memorial flight at Coningsby to delight an air show audience, most of whom could not have been born when in 1941 this Spitfire was the fastest fighter in the RAF. The origins of the Spitfire began ten years earlier than that. In 1931, the fastest fighters in the RAF were these most elegant Hawker Fury biplanes. They're the first RAF fighters to exceed 200 miles per hour in level flight. Powered by a 650 horsepower Rolls-Royce engine, they have a maximum speed of 207 miles per hour and are delightful to fly. At that time, these two men had other ideas about the speed of RAF aircraft. Sir Henry Royce and Reginald Mitchell. Royce was the driving force behind the Rolls-Royce car and aero engine concern. Reginald Mitchell was chief designer for the Supermarine Company of Woolston, Southampton, which specialized in the construction of flying boats. Mitchell had designed a series of all-metal monoplane racing seaplanes, entered as the RAF high-speed flight, to compete for the Schneider Trophy, an international event for seaplanes which became the venue for the absolute world speed record. Britain had won the two previous meetings. To win the trophy outright, Britain had to win the third meeting to be held at Calshot in 1931. The Air Ministry declined to finance the three aircraft. To the lasting shame of the government of the day, it was left to a private citizen, Lady Houston, to put up £100,000 for the construction of the 1931 seaplanes Mitchell had designed. They were built around a new 36-litre V12 supercharged Rolls-Royce R engine, designed and developed to produce the then unheard of figure of 2,600 horsepower. This enabled the Supermarines to win the Schneider Trophy outright, and then to raise the absolute world speed record to a staggering 406.7 miles per hour. The Supermarine was not the prototype for the Spitfire. Impressive though the performance of the seaplanes had undoubtedly been, they were in no sense practical aircraft. The Sprint engines had to be stripped and overhauled after every five hours running. In 1931, none of the RAF's grass airfields would have been large enough for them to take off as land planes. The experience gained enabled Mitchell to design and build a monoplane RAF fighter. It was unofficially called Spitfire and flew in 1934. However, the performance was disappointing. That Spitfire was to end its days as a gunnery target. Back to the drawing board. Mitchell revised the design with a retractable undercarriage and enclosed cockpit, though still retaining the underpowered Rolls Goshawk. The Air Ministry was not enthusiastic. A still later version, again Goshawk powered, was offered. It also failed to excite official interest, though the elliptical wings hinted at a familiar shape to come. In 1934, Rolls-Royce had been on the point of giving up aero engine manufacture. They announced a new engine based on the record-breaking 36-litre Schneider Trophy R that had been scaled down to a mere 27 litres to produce a lightweight V12 military aero engine in the 1,000 horsepower class. It was to be named Merlin. In 1934, it represented the world peak of applied technology. Excited by the promise of this powerful new Rolls-Royce engine, Mitchell proposed in 1935 a final revision of his rejected monoplane. It was clean and purposeful. However, the elliptical wings caused official disquiet, for though aerodynamically efficient, they would be difficult to manufacture. Nevertheless, a £10,000 contract was offered for the prototype to be ready by October 1935. At Hawker's, a rival fighter is on the drawing board. It's been designed by Sidney Cam, who was also responsible for the Fury, and it too will be a Merlin-powered monoplane. As you know, we've been thinking around this problem for some time, and without any doubt it means leaving the biplane, which we know so well, and going to the monoplane with heavier armament, and many new features such as close cockpit, tractable undercarriage, higher wing loading, and of course, new structural problems. The biplane Fury became the monoplane Hurricane. In 1935, 600 were ordered. 
The Hurricane was an easier proposition to manufacture than the rival Spitfire. It was the end of a simple wood, metal and fabric technology which began with the Sopwiths of 1917. The Spitfire was a complex new all-metal technology. The planning of Britain's new air program begins to show results. Preview is given of Vickers' contribution to the mightier air fleet, which will bring air supremacy to Britain. The Spitfire takes off first. This is the latest type of single-seater fighter and, as you can see, a monoplane. In design and construction, she is not unlike the last Snyder Trophy winner. That she is going to be a great asset to the RAF is pretty obvious. We are flying along in our own plane at about 175. So what speed she is capable of, you may judge from the pace at which she overtakes us. July 1936. Geoffrey Quill, the test pilot. Mitchell was in the chase plane. Sadly, he was not to live to see his design into production, for he died the following year of cancer at the early age of 42. Mitchell was succeeded by his chief draftsman, Joe Smith, as the Spitfire went into production. Mitchell had this power, of, uh, not only was he a great designer, but he had this essential uh, quality that he was able to build up an extremely competent team around him and to really make it work as a team and control it. And this is, of course, what this is a good aeroplane. It can't be done any other way. I think it's right to say that at the time, not everybody believed that the Spitfire was uh, a good aeroplane or even a practical aeroplane. There was a very widely held view that it was far too much influenced by the, uh, the racing experience that supermarines had and that it was, in fact, nothing more or less than a sort of racehorse which was quite unsuitable for the, the hurly-burly of service life and a lot of people thought it was, uh, the engineering was too difficult, it couldn't be produced. And it very nearly wasn't, for what would become a depressingly familiar failing of British industry was soon manifest. The production of the first order for 310 Spitfires fell behind schedule and went over budget. There were appalling delays because of the inability of the subcontractors to actually fabricate, for example, the wings of the Spitfire. And, and so the Spitfire was delivered to the squadrons 18 months after the Messerschmitt 109 was delivered to the German squadrons. The Messerschmitt is, uh, is a sort of Mercedes job. In other words, it, it entirely understands uh, production engineering, the problems of fabrication and manufacture, and was designed as that from the start. And therefore it is less romantic, less beautiful, but in its way just as effective and much more easy to produce. And what people don't often realize is that the later marks of Spitfire took three times the man hours to produce as the later marks of Messerschmitt. I think the difference between the Spitfire and the, and the Messerschmitt is a total difference in the philosophy of, of making anything. Uh, to me, the Spitfire is part of British romanticism and, and love of individual craftsmanship, you know, the beautiful thing, the kind of sports car ideal, um, and was designed by Mitchell himself uh, with no idea whatsoever about the problems of production engineering. No, it wasn't designed with mass production, 22,000 eventually in mind at all. It was an advanced aeroplane, a thoroughbred aeroplane with no concessions to anything except aerodynamics. And the Spitfire was a very advanced aeroplane for its time because it was just the start of stress skin wings and fuselage. Fuselage of the Spitfire never gave any problem but the wings were complete. They were very thin, much thinner than any previous aeroplane and they were elliptical to get the best aerodynamic results. So they were a complicated production job. And supermarines didn't do them themselves. Supermarines, when the Spitfire came into production, had only 600 people. By 1940, they doubled it, and by the end of the war, they had 10,000 spread around. But the wings were subcontracted out to uh, general aircraft, to Pobjoy motors, to press steel at Cowley. And so they were built in various places and then brought together, and they didn't all fit together. So this held up things to begin with. But it's unfair to say they didn't get going, because they did. As Spitfire production belatedly got underway in 1938, the last months of peace were ebbing away. 